which quite nicely brings us on to question number two, which is getting to know your back, which is uh, chapter number two in the book. And what I'd like to do in this uh, question is in some ways sort of expand and maybe go a little bit more specific on some of the things you just mentioned in question one and just talk a bit more specifically about what are common causes of disc herniations and maybe what are some patterns that you see in those types of injuries? Yes. Well, um, first of all, the torso uh, has a ball and socket joint at the top in the shoulders and at the bottom in the hips. But the spine joints themselves are not ball and socket joints. The discs are actually strands of collagen. Uh, and they are adhered together with uh, a ground substance. So uh, let's take the person who does a lot of bending and they want to dance and do all these kinds of spine uh, moving things, which is fine. Um, in order to get the movement, they must loosen the collagen to get the flexibility in their spine. Um, that's an adaptation. Now, let's contrast that with a power lifter who has to lift extremely heavy weights. If they had loosened collagen by doing a lot of mobility, they would be at, at risk because uh, you've now lost the load-bearing ability uh, to extreme levels. So your spine adapts. Uh, you can either have a lot of mobility or a lot of load-bearing ability, but you can't really mix the two because the adaptations of the collagen is, is very different with both processes. So having said that, um, a disc herniation is a delamination of the collagen strands. So in the average person, the mechanism is usually repeated bending coupled with compression. One or two, one of those on their own really doesn't formulate the, the uh, mechanism leading to a bulge. So it might be someone who's doing a lot of gardening or, or repeated bending because they've got uh, a stiff hip joint or something like that. Uh, and then uh, it, the, 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 the strands of uh, collagen uh, become a bit delaminated. Then through compression, you pressurize the nuclear gel in the middle of the disc and it will seep through the delaminations. Um, now, why do some people get them and others not? Well, as it turns out, there's a great predisposition to this. I'll give you an example. Let's take a very slender willow branch. You can bend the willow branch back and forth and it really doesn't create stress and, and the willow branch can survive many, many cycles. No, no issue at all. But if you took a thicker branch and bent it one or two cycles to the same amount of bend, it will shatter right away. The reason being the stress in a round branch or tube is a function of its thickness. So now when we take um, a slender person, uh, they can bend and do sit-ups and dance and do all kinds of things with no real stress developing in their spine. But when you take a thicker boned person, say a prop in rugby or, or a very heavy framed person and ask them to do sit-ups, that creates much higher stress in the thicker spine than in the uh, thinner spine. And it also turns out that there's a, a, a spectrum of disc shape as well. If you were to look down on the spine from the top and, and, and slice it transversely, some discs are quite ovoid and others look more like a lima bean. The lima bean shape, which is more associated with a thicker spine, actually gets disc bulges a lot um, faster than, than the uh, ovoid spine. So anyway, uh, you, you, there are all these personal factors that predispose some people, um, and some people do inappropriate training. They they think that doing uh, sit-ups every day when they have a thick spine um, will give them core strength 
whereas uh, it was just over time loosening the collagen. They would have been much wiser, much more pain resilient, and actually much more athletic by doing, say, a stir the pot kind of exercise where they would uh, place their elbows on a gym ball, their feet are on the ground, and they do circles through the elbows, building the, uh, the, the, the athleticism in their core without mimicking the mechanism for um, disc bulges. But anyway, most people, when they understand the mechanism of their bulge, uh, they can um, really uh, desensitize it and learn to move in a way that doesn't mimic the, the mechanism. Disc bulges don't just happen. They have a very specific uh, movement and load uh, trigger. So I hope that, um, first of all, gives encouragement to people and uh, lets them realize that a good understanding uh, that comes through an assessment um, uh, and, and particularly as it's described in that chapter, will guide them as to movement strategies to uh, remove the mechanism and allow the pain sensitivity to wind down and, and get on with life. And when we get further into, the, um, into this podcast, what we'll try and do is we might revisit those two people, so that big thick um, prop and maybe a slender more dancer. And when we talk about the core program and the hip program, Maybe we'll try and uh, talk about what might be a good core program for one person and what might be a good core program for the other person and try to sort of use that those two examples as a way of um, understanding um, if you can relate to it whilst you're listening to it, what kind of program that you might need to be doing um, out, out in the big wide world uh, of, 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 health, of the health and fitness industry. But for now, yeah, may I add a, a little thought that just came as an afterthought to that, uh, Chris? You, you, th there will be many uh, listeners who've who've been told that they have a disc bulge because it was seen on an MR. Um, many of those disc bulges are dynamic in that they grow and shrink. And, uh, you know, there are some people who say, well, the MR doesn't show pain, which is absolutely true. But... Um, you need to, an understanding of the patient to interpret those images. Uh, radiologists never see the patient, so they never have a context for interpreting the signs that they see on the MR. Uh, we, we, we've seen many examples over the years where if a person got in a certain position and then we take the MR after five minutes, they have a very large disc bulge. And then we take another position and reshoot the MR, and the disc bulge has shrunken magnificently. So it's just proof that they are in control of the size of that bulge and, and how to get it to, to shrink or grow and be symptomatic um, or not. But I just thought, once again, I'd uh, just try and give people encouragement that they really are in control a lot of these things that you know, it, it breaks my heart when, when a clinician says to them, oh, well, uh, the pain is in your head. And that just usually shows me that the clinician didn't have the expertise to show the, 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 the patient the precise cause of uh, whether they had a disc bulge and uh, the associated pain pattern or some other um, uh, back pain trigger.